Every week, it's my goal to share a story of someone's journey through their life and financial vineyard. We take you from their roots to the journey of their vines and the influences in the air that have helped craft their delicious lives. Like wine, life and finances have different palates that should be celebrated and not judged. In this episode of Wine and Dime, we welcome Randy Ullum. Randy is literally a winemaker, has worked in the vineyard industry for years and years and years, fits perfectly and to our show of Wine and Dime. Listen on as Randy shares his journey of how he ultimately ended up working for Kendall Jackson Winery. And Randy and I uh, enjoy a great Chardonnay. We, we talk about a couple of different ones throughout the show. We enjoy a great Chardonnay. We hope you very much enjoy this show. I certainly enjoyed recording it. So sit on back, grab your favorite beverage and welcome to the show. We are thrilled to have our guest here today. And when we talk about my passion for wine, now let's get even deeper. Randy, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure to join you today. Well, we are, as I said, absolutely thrilled. Um, as, as many people know, I am a novice wine <laughs> drinker. I, lo- I think it's about the journey of finding the wine that we like, right? So before we dig into the true formation of your, of your vineyard, um, I am drinking a Kendall Jackson Grand Reserve Chardonnay today. What are you drinking? The Grand Reserve. Well, I actually have three, just in case. Ah. <laughs> There's Reserve here. Okay. And the Grand Reserve, too. Mm-hmm. And I have the, the Camelot uh, Highlands uh, Chardonnay from Santa Barbara. So I think I'm too ahead of you. <laughs> That's okay. And tell us why I'm um, sort of digging in. Tell us why it's so important today that we're drinking Kendall Jackson uh, Chardonnay. Well, it's it, it's a wonderful wine. It's a wine that uh, provides a smile and happiness to the to the consumer. It's consistent. It's it's um, a winery that's family run and family owned. Kendall Jackson, the actually the Vintners Reserve Chardonnay has been the number one selling wine for probably twenty seven ish years and we have we have different tiers so chardonnay is our mainstay and chardonnay mm-hmm. is the one. one of the things yeah. that well one of the things i love about chardonnay um as a i would say self-proclaimed red drinker but one of the things that i love about chardonnay is especially kendall jackson chardonnay is the butteriness of it so whenever i get a chardonnay that is barrel aged steel barrel aged i should say it, it has a that different crispness to it that that um mineraliness to it. So when I drink a Chardonnay, what I look for in a Chardonnay is always how much oak am I getting? How much butter am I getting on the palate when I actually drink the Chardonnay? And that's what I like about Chardonnay is that, and in the fall particular is where we're recording this podcast in our neck of the woods where I am today. I think it may have gotten up to 65. It's pretty cool outside. (laughs) So grabbing a nice warm Chardonnay, like a, a what I mean is a warm flavored Chardonnay is one of my favorite things to do in the fall. That's what we offer uh, everyone. I mean, we, we have, we do make a stainless steel tank fermented Chardonnay called Devant. So that, that is, as you, as you mentioned, you know, it's without the butter, the malolactic, without, without the effect of the barrel fermentation. So it's, you know, crisper and leaner and, and very bright. But the, all the other wines are Vintners Reserve, Chardonnay, the Grand Reserve, you said, uh, which you have a glass of, and our Jackson Estate Chardonnays. They're all barrel fermented. Uh, the Vintners Reserve is 93 to 95 barrel percent barrel fermented. The Grand Reserve and, and above, the Jackson Estate, they're all 100 percent barrel fermented. And that's incredibly important for a number of different reasons. When you ferment uh, a juice, Chardonnay juice, in a barrel, it's about 60 gallons, 59 to 60 gallons. It, it, you put the yeast in, you know, to, to, to do the fermentation, but it builds that roundness and that mid palate that's so wonderful. And then after, after the fermentation, you, you have the, the, the yeast falls to the bottom of the barrel and they're called lees. And we stir those lees 
every month or every two weeks to add mm-hmm. the sort of silver elegance to the side of the uh, to, of the of the palate, and then we also let it go through that secondary fermentation, so you get the little the butter tone, a nice kiss of butter, and then since it's in barrels, be it French and American for our Vintners Reserve or all French for the Grand Reserve and above, you you a little depending on the amount of new oak that you give it, which we don't because we give it a whole lot because we're all about the fruit tones in the mm-hmm, in the mm-hmm. wine. So the it's sort of a supporting role there to kind of round it out, give a little of the vanilla tones that you in toasty tones that you that mm-hmm. you like. Mm-hmm. So, I'm right with you. I, I love these wonderful, rich wines that are like a liquid meal unto themselves. They are. You know, I love fruit for dinner. <laughs> I love the fact that you called it a liquid, a liquid meal. <laughs> there's, there's nothing better than, especially on a Friday. So as we sit here and taste uh Uh, wine on a Friday afternoon, sharing your background. I I really want to dig into a little bit um, about your journey. I I know that when we were setting this up, um, I was given a very nice one page background uh, of you yourself. And you personally have some background in upstate New York where I am at the moment. So when I read that, I'm like, perfect, right? So often we feature a lot of the New York wine. Where were you from in upstate New York or where did you spend some time? Well, yeah, I, was, I wasn't really from there, but I, I spent time in Westfield, New York, yeah. on Lake Eagle, it's about yeah. an hour south of Buffalo. Yep. Yeah, that's a really, you know, it's a nice area. You have you know, the, the reason that's a, a growing area region is because of the lake, Lake Erie, and how that, bot, that water mass affects the, the climate there. Back in the day, you know, that was that was my very first job was actually in a little winery in Ohio, still along uh, near Cleveland, along the same lake. And then I started, I worked in, in Westfield for five years. And the climate is still a little bit tough there for, for Venetia. It's wonderful for the American varieties, but it's Labrusca or Americana, like Concord and things like that. Mm-hmm. But for the Venifera, which are a little bit more susceptible to the cold and Lord knows it would get really cold there sometime. And Vinifera, I think it's below either 17 or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. You tend to kill off the little bud, poor little buds in the mm-hmm. plant. Yeah. So it's a tough, it's a tough, um, tough variety there. But I, I love Chardonnay back then, and I was trying to graft Chardonnay onto vines. And, and the folks I worked with sort of thought I was nuts. And what do you, what do you do? And I thought well, I love Chardonnay, so let's try and growing it. I mean, it's the variety of, of the future, but one thing led to another, and after five years, I realized it's a it is a tough life here, and and I wanted to expand my horizons. So so I came out to to California. Actually, the interesting thing is be, between Ohio and New York, I had I had gone out to Cali- come out to California to interview, and when I got out here, you know, I, I grew up on the East Coast where it's green and lush and wonderful all year long. And I came out to California and I thought, oh, my God, who in their right mind would live here? I've got a really nice job offer in the Carneros area by a very reputable winery. And I and I actually said, I can't I can't do this. You know, it's 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 it's, it's, it's a wasteland out here because <laughs> the hills were you know brown and everything. I went back and took the job offer I had in, in Westfield, New York. And then after five years, I realized, well, if I really want to you know, move ahead in life, I need to you know, kind of bite my tongue and go back to California, which I did, and landed a job at Loach Vineyards, just outside of Santa Rosa, up in Sonoma County. Mm-hmm. And the hills were still brown, but <laughs> one and a half years there, and it's in the part of the Russian River. And after a few years, you're out, you realize, oh, those hills that's now the cold, sprinkled with oak trees and redwoods here and there. But it was a, a, a nice, smart move on my part to come out here to California, because especially in the Russian River, it's the heart of premier Chardonnays in the state. Of course, we grow great, we grow great Chardonnay also in Mendocino County to the north of Sonoma and Santa Barbara County, mm-hmm. where your Grand Reserve is from, and also mm-hmm. Monterey. So I take, started, oh, I'm sorry, go uh, ahead. After 12 and a half years with, with Deloach, Jess Jackson hired me to come work with him uh, 20, be 27 years ago. This is my 28th harvest with 
with the family here in California. So my first couple of years, I did the international startups down in Chile, Argentina, Australia, mm-hmm. Italy, and France. And then he asked me to take over brand Kendall Jackson. And you know, with that came a, came a lot of acres of grapes, a lot of cases of wine. But it's been fun because we're on a, a, a growth mode, rapid growth mode in those days. Purchasing land, developing vineyards, purchasing vineyards, developing wineries, purchasing wineries. All these things have just been really excited and we've really grown uh, over the years. And the most important part of all of this is just was always focused on quality and, and not quantity. Mm-hmm. So we would take the high road. Everything we do is, is exceptional and, and we try to improve upon that every year. And one of the neat things is we use real barrels for our fermentations. We Our, our Chardonnays are 100% Chardonnay. Our Chardonnays are 100% coastal, mm-hmm. where you have the effect of a cool climate of the Pacific, giving you that nice longer growing season. And all of our vineyards are sustainable. So all of that rolled into one it makes a one a fantastic product. We have great vineyard managers, great great winemaking team and seller team, and everybody is so passionate about the quality. It's just it's just a really fun fun experience. And and I want to take listeners back. So you've talked about your journey uh, in working with a lot of wineries and how you've come to where we are today. But one of the things I also noticed on your um, on your background was that this is not something that is new in your blood. Like you didn't wake up one day and say, oh, I think I'm interested in wine like I did. Um, you actually were native to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which for a lot of people do not realize Michigan has quite a wine country of its own. Uh, especially along the lakes, right? And they have, and they've been developing over time, especially I would say what, maybe the last 10 to 15 years. But your sure. father actually was a winemaker. Yeah, yeah, to, to, to a degree. So so it's interesting because um, when I was in, well, I was born in Ann Arbor and lived there for almost six years and then moved to uh, Lexington, Massachusetts for maybe, you know, five or six years. And then from there to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I finished <laughs> high school um, uh, days. But during that period, especially in Pittsburgh, my father was, because of the proximity to Erie, and Lake Erie, uh, that wine growing belt up there, he decided to start making wine you know, in five gallon carboys in the basement. And, mm-hmm. and I'm looking at that, gee, look at this. My dad's turning this, you know, water and grape juice into wine and uh, drinking it and it was fun it was fun to watch that process and that's the same time you know being in in high school in those days where the drinking age was a lot lower mm-hmm. uh, i i entered into liking uh, wine more than beer so i was definitely in the minority and of course my first wine was uh, boone's farm uh, <laughs> it was everybody's right <laughs> and that moved up to answers and matus and all the den and things like that but so having watched him do that and, and you know, turn you know, grape juice, grapes and grape juice into wine, and, and, and it was fun to watch and, and taste, and especially since I was a young wine drinker myself. And then after I graduated, I went to study mining engineering. And so I'm, I'm a fanatic about skiing. And so there are three great uh, mining schools, one's in Arizona, one's in Boulder, Colorado, and one was in Salt Lake City. And so I picked the one in Salt Lake City because it had the absolute best snow uh, champagne powder uh, in the United States. And so I was, my major was mining engineering with a minor in skiing. My minor took more time than my major about Christmas time. Little, little did I know that they, they actually they sent the report card to your parents, not to you. And so when I was home for Christmas and my dad looked at that, uh, he said, no, oh, we're not paying for that. And uh, so I said, oh, my, uh, maybe I'll take a little break and, and continue my skiing endeavors, which I did there, which then led me to run out of snow in the end of the season. And I thought, now what? So I went down to Chile with a friend, not knowing that Chile was a big wine area, but it definitely uh-huh. was great for skiing. And I get down there and realized it was the opposite of America. In America, kind of at my age, everybody drank beer. Hardly anybody drank wine down in Chile. 
don't think anybody drank beer, and everybody was expected to drink wine. In fact, mm-hmm. every restaurant you already had a white wine glass and a red wine glass there at the table. There was no doubt you were drinking wine. And the plan was just to go there and ski for 30 days and kind of work my way back up to America. I ended up falling in love with the country and the people and the wines and the way of life and stayed there for three years. Wow. During this time, I, I was enjoying wine left and right. And I met a lot of people who had vineyards, who made wine, who sold wine, who distributed wine. And during that period, I also met this gal um, whose father um, um, was, a, was a, some, for some reason, he liked me and uh, put me under his wing. And, and uh, Juanita Ferrer, and her father was a fine wine aficionado and fine food uh, kind of guy. And so he he then taught me everything that he knew about the wines of Chile, all levels, all areas, and then invited me to enjoy the wines in his cellar from around the world and, and, and taught me you know, how to get about those. And on top of that, he was he was nuts for fine food. He refused to go to the restaurants because even the best restaurants couldn't cook as good as, good as he or his staff. And so he, he shared all of these wonderful concoctions with me with the wine. And I thought, oh my God, this is life. And then after the reason I actually had to leave, well, I didn't have to leave, I just got tired of living in Chile because when I was down there and walked into the country, not knowing anything about anything, so where's the ski area? It was a country that was you know, socialist, heading towards communism, and then there was a coup after a little over two years, and then the military came in, and it just wasn't much fun, mm-hmm. not much in the way of freedom. So that's when I left and came back to America and decided, i got to figure out how to get a job at the wine and great vineyard business, which is a lot more fun than mining. And so I switched my career path and school uh, to get a degree in, in Phenology, which is wine making, and viticulture, which is growing grapes. Mm-hmm. And so I, I and I, as we started out the session, my first job was in Ohio. In mm-hmm. the rest is history. So I mean that when we talk to people on the show about their journey in life, like how did they get to where they are right now? I mean, yours was not typical of everybody else. It's, it never seems to be this straight path. You know, there's this, um, if you think about how a vineyard is set up, there's always these nice rows, right? They're all very well manicured, nice rows that you get to walk down or see or oversee if you're flying up above. But life is never truly like that. (laughs) And in the end, though, we're usually able to bring all of our experiences and I say at the end, not necessarily at the end of our lives, but at some point in time in our careers, we're usually able to bring all of those unique experiences into perfect rows like most vineyards are. And when we fast forward to you mentioning that, you know, you went out to California and you started to take on a role with, uh, you said it was just Jackson, right? Was the one, the one that you initially started working with. Could you have thought that? And then, and then came over to just Jacks with just Jacks. Okay. Okay. Could you have imagined where your career was going to take you and the travels? No idea. It, it's just, uh, you know, being in the right place at the right time. And also, you know, at, at, at you know, I liked Chardonnay back in New York. I, I was a proponent of it. I felt deeper in love with it. it, it with Deloach Vineyards in the Russian River Valley, Sonoma County Chardonnay, and we made a Chardonnay somewhat similar to what Just Jackson was making with his Vintners Reserve, and then he and he noticed that, and his whole company, he passed away about seven, eight years ago, but, but his whole vision started with Chardonnay, and he, he, he took a liking to me, uh, also, he had a desire to go down to Chile. He'd been down there a number of times. I'd actually kept going down there, and we we would not cross paths, but we would have we crossed the same path at different times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We would mention that to him and to I. And so we thought, well, that guy likes Chile. That guy enjoys Chardonnay. I've got a little bit of everything for him. So he talked me into coming and joining him. I had no idea that in the beginning of the, where this would all all lead to, because over the years, you know, I've I've been you know, named the wine master for Kendall Jackson, I've been the COO for, for the company a number a couple of years, and then back to just sort of winemaking, vineyard stuff. Uh, 
but you know, I'm, I'm blessed with a wonderful job. You know, I get to meet many people and there's a lot of PR work and marketing work and sales. But we all have to remember, and going back to the geology and mining days, that all of this starts in the vineyard with good dirt. It, the, the soil, right? The, the soil. Um, one of the things, so this year we're not able to travel, right? So we're kind of stuck within our own little regions, I guess you want to say. And so because we couldn't travel, I decided that I was going to quote unquote travel by taste. So I started out in France. Um, we have a, in the Finger Lakes area, we have a vineyard that the winemakers are actually from France. And so uh, Domaine Lansour is the name of it. And so I like drank some of their wine for a month and then I went to Germany. <laughs> and so there's a winemaker that's actually from Germany that's here again in, in upstate New York and, and, and drank all their wines. So then I started to think, well, what else? I want to go to France or Italy. So I decided on Italy and started drinking, like looking for um, wineries that uh, um, feature like a Sangiovese uh, grape, because that that does tend to grow here in the, the the Finger Lakes area a little bit better than other uh, Italian wines do. Um, and then when I actually learned about, oh, well, that's actually Chianti. Like I didn't, you know, that's the grape that's used in Chianti. And I then, know. and then I started looking for, um, then I started looking for types of wine. So I moved on from Italy and then started looking for types of wine that I want to drink and then figuring out what country I could visit to have like a Chardonnay. Riesling, I mean, fairly easy because that's either usually Germany, Austria or our area, New York area. But Chardonnays are a special breed. <laughs> Right, sure. They're a very special breed. So so you started to say, and I interrupted you, but you started to talk about the earth and the dirt and the soil. Talk a little bit about how important that is and the minerals that are in the soil. When I talk to people about their lives, I'm like, what are the influences that you've had? What are the minerals that you've been given to grow your career or you know help meet your life goals? But in this case, both the Chardonnay and your life, what are the minerals that that have actually helped the Chardonnay? Well, for, 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 for the Chardonnay, you, you get different nuances and different flavors and aromas based on the different terroirs. And terroir is a, a one spot on earth and it, it, it's an all enveloping uh, term, which means the site, the soil, the weather, the water holding capacity of the soil, the slope of the of the site, the aspect, whether it's pointing north, east, or southwest, um, the elevation, all of that brings you to the terroir of a site. Now we can kind of take a take the coast of California and make a bell curve out of each of the different cool appellations or counties of flavors because one of the fortunate things we we have going for us is we have a, a lot of acres of Chardonnay that are our own, and the, and probably 85% uh, of the Chardonnay is from our own vineyards for Vintners Reserve. For the Grand Reserve and above, it's 100%. But we keep all these vineyards and all the little blocks that have all these different little terroirs separate, little micro terroirs separate. So we have, you know, a thousand to taste through all the time. And you can develop a, 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 a sort of flavor profile, bell curve of flavors by the different areas along the cool coast of California where we are. So as an example, and this, this goes right back to the, you know, to the soil and the dirt and the location, Mendocino County gives you sort of a crisp green apple. When you go down to Sonoma County and you're in the Russian River, it's more ripe apple, uh, creme brulee. And then you hit Carnivora, be it Sonoma or Napa, and you get the pear tones and pear oil and that oily viscosity in the palate. Then you move further down to, say, Monterey, and there you get the lemon tones, the lime tones. And remember, these are all just natural uh, flavors that come from the grape. We don't add add mm -hmm. all. It's, it's but, what's in the soil, right? I mean, it's what's in the soil that gives them that flavor. The fact that it's, that it's Chardonnay. And, and that grape. And so that's the lemon and the lime. And then you can go down to San Luis Obispo, or really we're big in, in, in Santa Barbara County. And there you get the tropical tones, the pineapple, the mango, the papaya, and in certain areas that could become 
you know, really into this and say, you know, the terroir of Camelot Islands are high end Chardonnay. There, that is like has this oily viscosity to it that just lingers on and on. So, so that's where the earth and the soils really come into play for these different flavors. Now, you can uh, you can modify them a little bit by by using different clones. So you have the grape. Uh, or the species Vitus vinifera, then you have the grape, the grape, and then you have the variety Chardonnay, and then within Chardonnay you have different clones. And so I'm talking about sort of the regular workhorse clone form, but you have Dijon clones that are more floral in the nose and the palate. You have the the Ruin clones that actually smell like like um, oh gosh, like a Gewurz or a Muscat. You know, that just adds a little. You know, it's very minute percentages adds a little special nuance to, to the blend. But again, it's all 100% Chardonnay. But everything relates back to its spot. And even in one vineyard, let's say the vineyard is in you know, uh, Santa Barbara, Los Alamos area, and there might be 20 blocks in this vineyard. You'll have different soils within that block. You'll have different uh, row angles or elevations or aspect. All of those things add up to to making the grape a little different and unique. And then once you bring that into the wine and you crush your grapes or press your grapes into juice, and then what do you do then? You know, stainless fermented barrel. You mm-hmm. love our barrel. You mm-hmm. see French or American. What's the grain tightness? Where what's the forest source of that oak, especially in France? All those Forests are kind of like appellations for grapes for us. They have a different nuance. How do you toast it? We have 120 ways to toast the barrel. And then throw onto that, well, what kind of yeast are we going to use? How often do we stir the leaves? Mm-hmm. And, and how long do we want to age it? Oh, and the other important part is what percent of those barrels are new? Mm-hmm. The most barrel character, the higher the percent. And again, how are we going to meld all that together to make a fruit forward wine that has a nice touch of oak and butter and has a lingering finish that brings a smile to your face and beckons for another second? <laughs> well, people can't see our faces as we're listening to the podcast, but fortunately, you and I are recording via Zoom, so we're watching each other. And um, we had a little technical difficulty at the beginning of the podcast, and not that I was stressed out about it in any way, but, you know, it's it's a little frustrating sometimes. But after a few sips of this, I definitely am feeling a little more lighter, and <laughs> it's bringing a smile to my face and a little rose to my cheeks, as it usually does. <laughs> so are you still making wine? Are you part of that process? Are you still involved in the wine making process? Yeah, completely. And we have a tremendous team because we have a lot of different areas that we cover. But yes, um, you know, this is the time of the year that you spend, you know, half the day, if not all day, out in the vineyards, mm-hmm. uh, tasting grapes. And you know, once they're picked, you know, that decision's done, and off to the winery they go. So I spend more time in the vineyards than in the wineries, actually, this time of the year. And then once everything harvest is over, you know, we taste. There's a lot of a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes, but mm-hmm. work on taste with the team, uh, you know, at a, at a maximum every 90 days, but more often if possible, and then grading and scoring all those wines. It takes you know, out of a you know a three month period, you're going to be tasting wine every day for for a month, and you'll have a, to keep good. That's a month. horrible job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the final sign-off. So, at, you know, at the end, of, we have a killer, beautiful team that have all worked together for a really long time. But at the end of the day, whether whether you like it or you don't like it, it's my responsibility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as, um, are you guys in harvest yet? Have you already started yes, harvest? Yeah, yeah. The last few days of August, we're not going full speed, but we're, I take that back. We're going full speed in the north coast in Mendocino and in Sonoma County, pretty much, uh, with the with the whites and just getting into gear with the and with the pinots and then uh-huh. for the abs and things. So we're just getting going there. Okay. Down in Monte fairly started. We've, we've we've started picking some pinots for rose. That's mm. the area as usual last uh, on our list areas to harvest sort of towards the middle part of October. 
and then um, Santa Barbara. We're kind of like, you know, popping around hither and heather, trying a few loads to see how it's going. But we're not anywhere near full speed there. And I, I predict we won't be until a week from this. Um, okay. We'll be in full in Santa Barbara and probably two and a half, three weeks um, this Sunday will be full speed. So about the time this podcast is released, you will be full speed ahead on your harvest process, <laughs> the sounds of it. Um, what are the challenges that you're seeing out in that area this year? Um, it, well, we've had, you know, the, the growing season has been absolutely perfect up until you know, just recently. We've had been, have a lot of fire activity uh, all over and everybody was, was and has been quite worried about that. And, and the effects of the fires. But after extensive analysis and, and looking at what's going on, our Chardonnays, they are crystal clear, crystal clean. So, so we're blessed to that. Great. Very happy. Yeah, a lot of people, I mean, we've seen, uh, being on the East Coast, we've seen a lot of the news that's coming out of Oregon, Washington, uh, California, Colorado, that whole area with quite a few um wildfires that are taking place and the smoke is just lingering in the air. And I almost think some of that smoke actually has made it out our way because for a couple mornings, the sunrises were so unique. They were that the, the, the uh, sun and even in the evening was an orange color, not, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a normal looking sun and it didn't look like it was all that cloudy outside. So I almost think some of that smoke actually made it way out to the Northeast, but wondered if that was impacting um, the region at all this year significantly, uh, both in the flick, because again, it goes back to the fact that it's some of the, it's not just, I, a lot of it comes from the soil, right? But it also comes with what's surrounding it in the air and that can impact the flavor of of the way the grape is being developing. Right. Because, yeah. And we've been pretty blessed because the, the smoke, and you're right, I mean, it's just Cleared here three days ago, where we now you can see blue sky and sunshine. So, but we had a number of weeks where there was a high overcast, you know, fog plus clouds plus some mm-hmm. smoke, and you get those sort of orangey uh, sunsets. Mm-hmm. If you could see the sun. Uh, the the level though of the smoke has been very high okay. in elevation, and so that's helped to to allow you know, our, our chardonnays to be kept crystal. Great. Um, Randy, we want to say thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and information about uh, Chardonnays on the show, because often, unfortunately, because I do tend to, to lean towards the reds a lot, people hear so much about different red wine. They don't hear a ton about some of the whites, in particular Chardonnay, which is a wine, as long as it's buttery, is wine that I actually do enjoy very much. Um, so I want to say thank you, but we have two sort of final questions that we love to ask all of our guests. And this question can be professional, it can be a bit personal, whatever, however you want to respond to it. But we love to ask people, what is their definition of success? Oh, well, for, the, um, for what they do or for they themselves? Either one, either one. Um, well, I, that's a... Big question. I think that, you know, for me, the, I, I feel successful in having been a part of this growing operation over the years and to bring, you know, happiness and success to, to the family, that the Jackson family. I, it's a tremendous success to have put together what I consider to be one of the best winemaking, uh, great growing winemaking teams in the in the country, if not the world, a team that's very aligned and under you know, each other. But that's a that's a tremendous success. And clearly, you get to do what you love every day. <laughs> yeah, I guess another. I mean, you could go on and on, I suppose. But yes, success in, in, in the working environment is having a job that is not really work. It's just. Yeah, yeah. And your hands, and you wake up every day with, especially in this business, you're at the, at the uh, mercy of Mother Nature, where she brings you new challenges every year. It makes life and harvest uh, different and keeps you <laughs> on your toe. But definitely waking up and anxious to go 
do what you love to do. Uh, not a lot of people can actually say no, that. No, they, and and in your case, I'm at least from all of the um, all of the folks that I've spoken to that work in a vineyard that actually work in a vineyard. Harvest is one of the most stressful times for them. So you know, towards the end of harvest, they might they might need a little vacay from <laughs> from the day to day grind of work working very hard during that period of time. It's a it's a finite amount of time, and you're fighting mother nature quite a bit during that period of time to try to get things taken care of, at least in our it's area. Probably, the, you know, the, if you're going to say, what's the most stressful, well, what would be something considered stressful during harvest? It's, you have to remember, once you call the pick on that vineyard and the grapes are picked, you can't put them back on. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the most, one of the most important parts. Of course, you've got to have a good grapes to begin with. But once you say pick them, you know, uh, and they arrive, uh, match you play to the winery the next day, you better have made the right decision there. That's, that's probably you know, the most important uh, part of your of your harvest. And then the other part, if you you know, you always sort of not stressed, but worried, you know, about Mother Nature, and you become a backseat uh, weatherman, mm-hmm. weather person, mm-hmm. first during this time of year, trying to outguess Mother Nature, mm-hmm. outguess the things and where they're going to go, what their effect is going to be, you know, a thousand miles away. Let's, let, that gave us some rain three weeks ago, some hurricane all the way down you know, south of Baja in Mexico. But that the extent of the reach from the eye to the edge of these, as you well know, can be a thousand, twelve hundred mm-hmm. miles. Mm-hmm. And we might get a few, you know, little little cloud here and there and some sprinkles. But um, yeah, it's kind of out guessing Mother Nature and respecting her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the final question that we love to ask our guests, we, we call this our nourish your vine section of the podcast, where we take just a few minutes for our guests to provide maybe the number one financial lesson. That's sort of the dime side of the podcast, the number one financial lesson that they've learned in their lives, if they're willing to share. Oh, gosh. Well, um, I guess and everyone should should everybody should do this. Uh, do not spend more than you make. <laughs> Helpful. <laughs> always, always pay your credit card bills down to zero every month. Don't go into debt there because the interest rate is too high. And uh, save every penny. A penny may not seem like a lot, but a uh, hundred or a thousand of them actually are. Yes, they, and they are. Will, so be 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 cognizant of what you're doing. And I always say, life is short. Drink the good wine first. <laughs> And life is drink bad wine. So that's right. Yeah. Life is too short to drink bad wine. Right. Cheers to cheers to this conversation. And I want to say thank you so much. If we could clink here, there we go. <laughs> uh, we would at this point in time. And I want to say thank you so much for first of all sharing um, the delicious wine that I did drink. I look forward to the to the other. Um, bottles that that arrived at the doorstep today. It was very kind of you to send that. I want to say thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and experiences so that people actually understand the journey uh, that you've gone through and the experiences that come with it, but also that you know, this is a this is actually a career that somebody can pursue as well. This is something that if you enjoy uh, skiing, apparently you can turn in turn that into <laughs> a career that actually ends up being more about winemaking. And we so appreciate the gifts that you shared with us today. And uh, I guess how can people uh, find out more about the winery and the wine. Where can they buy it? You know, what are some of the the details behind that? So we are in pretty much every, you know, our Vintners Reserve and Grand Reserve and every store, I would imagine, in the majority uh, retail shops across the country. The the Jackson Estate will be found in, in sort of specialty wine shops and restaurants. Um, granted, there's a restaurant challenge going on, but but definitely that's where that can be found. And then, you know, for those that, that someday would like to come out and visit us, we have a place called the Kendall Jackson Wine Estate and Gardens. And it's a visitor center. It's just a hair north of Santa Rosa on Highway 101 in Sonoma County, about an hour north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And people can come there and, and visit. We have these tremendous gardens, uh, mm-hmm. affinity garden for, for wine and in, in, in aroma compounds and then we have 
just a huge garden, garden, garden. And we have wonderful chefs. We do, besides just wine tastings, we do food and wine pairings. Lovely. Going to a restaurant, the restaurant, you know, it's all about the food and maybe the wine might work. But here, you come here and it's all about the wine and showcasing the wine and making it look even better with some great food from mm-hmm. our chefs in the garden. So that's really an experience mm-hmm. of, of, of all the experiences of all experiences. And it's the gateway to Sonoma County, the wine country and the vineyards. Also, you know, Sonoma County is like the Provence of, of, of Europe because of all the other things going on, the cheeses and, and the duck and the this and the that mm-hmm. out here. Mm-hmm. But if you're interested and want to learn more about Kendall Jackson, we have an amazing website, kj.com, very simple. And you can go there and you can get you know, down and dirty into everything you could ever imagine about you know, wine pairings and flavors, varieties. Who are the people behind the scenes? You might see some guy there, you know, with gray hair and a mustache, and or you might see, you know, a, a handful of other folks, of, of the other wine makers on our team. And uh, you'll learn about, you know, the different regions, the different appellations. And it, it, it's like going to a library just on, on, on the Internet. So I highly suggest kj.com. And also, if you can, to come visit us at the, at the Wine Estates and Gardens. Uh, we also have, the, this time of the year, because it's like, you know, late season and harvest time, we have once a month, sometimes twice a month, uh, uh, a dinner under the stars in the garden. Mm, it would be one table that held 120 people. Well, that's illegal now. And mm-hmm. so we now have a lot of, there are a lot of trees out in the garden, and so we have to place our six or eight, six, I guess it's six, six to eight mm-hmm. tables, you know, dispersed mm-hmm. Heather and Heather, which it's a wonderful spot because you're going to have great wines, great camaraderie. Uh, you will be able to taste it, it, what goes great with the wines, but the majority of everything you're going to eat came from that garden. Oh, that lovely. Lovely. Talk about farm to table. That's phenomenal. Yeah. Well, again, yeah. Randy, we thank you so much for being on the show and for spending your, uh, I guess, well, for me, it's the pretty much the end of the day, but for your your late, late uh, or early afternoon with us and um, for sharing your knowledge and experience and um, opening the eyes to others of Chardonnay. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Pleasure. My pleasure. It's an honor and a pleasure. And hope we can cross paths again soon. I hope so as well. Thank you. And that will about do it for today's episode of Wine and Dime. You can contact Amy through the website www.rootedpg.com or Amy at rootedpg.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at rootedpg for the latest news. And if you have any questions, comments, or topics you would like to hear about, feel free to let us know. And don't forget to rate and subscribe the show wherever you get your podcasts. And again, thank you for listening and be sure to tune in next time.